Virtual Solar Club Solar Sales Mastermind for today. Tonality, structure, and control in virtual solar sales. So um, let's start with an itinerary, as I always do. What we're going to be covering, and TSC, I'm going to be using that uh, tonality, structure, and control in virtual solar sales. was a bit too uh, large of a title to fit into my slides, but we'll work with this. TSC and solar sales are our itinerary for today. We're going to cover the big three. Tonality, virtual solar sales, why it's so important, why is it a language of and uh, of its own. So if you're going to the door, from the doors or coming from an in-home operation, or maybe you're not quite succeeding on the virtual side, it may be because you simply don't speak the language of virtual, of tonality uh, when it comes to uh, hitting virtual solar sales. I want to do a, a deep dive into that and see what that really means have some um, cool, fun uh, uh, references for you that maybe you'll understand and maybe uh, brighten your day in terms of how do I actually jump into the virtual side of things, see what tonality plays there. Pitch, structure fundamentals, the second piece, uh, uh, number two of the big three that we're going to be looking at. Your structure, what are you doing on the virtual solar sales side of things that is limiting your ability to, to reach your end goal? Structure is a big part of that your pitch structure, how things are ordered, your logic behind everything and presenting it to your customer in a certain uh, time frame and order. We're going to take a deep dive into that. Number three, the importance of control. Oh, sometimes that's a bad word. Hey, control. Nobody likes to be controlling, but maybe we're going to take a peek. Maybe, just maybe, there's some positives to be had if we take a look at control as a positive thing to benefit our customers and also benefit our uh, end results and how that plays into authority and uh, uh, power dynamics between us and our customers. Then I'm gonna wrap it all up in a nice clean bow, and we're gonna go five ways to implement tonality, structure, and control. Gonna give you some straight actionable items that if you hit these, if you practice these, you're going to see better results and you're gonna improve on your tonality, structure, and control when you're hitting virtual solar sales specifically. All right, does that sound fair? If that's fair, let's get right on with it. So first off, tonality, and virtual solar sales. I want to start off by introducing the 60-30-10 rule. Have you guys heard about this before? This is, uh, you know, it's like a sales 101 thing that you generally learn your fundamentals at. 60-30-10 rule tells us that in the animal kingdom, which we are a part of, uh, uh, communication is broken down into three parts. Uh, body language, tonality, and script. Body language, what we do while we communicate, speak, for, for animals, they're not speaking, right? We see animals have massive body language. That's 99% of their communication. Some of them don't even have any verbal cues. It's all body language. Tonality being 30%. So step down in the, in, uh, in the animal kingdom of communication. And it's not what we uh, say, but it's how we say it, how we speak. All right. And number three, uh, script being just 10%. Not how we say things, not what we do while we say things, but it is what we actually say. The words that we're putting in that email, the words that we're writing down on that script, right? The words that we are saying to customers. Now, obviously, I'm there's a, a big elephant in the room here. Josh, we're talking about virtual solar sales. What does body language have anything to do with it? Now, mind you, I'm sure there's a lot of people on here that still do Zoom. And don't just do phones on virtual. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. Hopefully you'll make the switch. Um, but uh, that's probably the first thing I'd say. Get rid of that. Um, on Zoom, sure, we have body language. But all Zoom is, right? So we, I've been doing virtual for almost 10 years now, virtual solar sales. And we never did Zoom or anything. Now, fair enough. The technology wasn't uh, where it was back then. But what I'm seeing is door-to-door in-person sales guys are moving virtual. And what they have, their arsenal of tools... Primarily, as we can see, naturally here is body language. And if you don't know that, just think about it. all you do in body language, how you control situations. Um, when you have that muscle that you've been building for so long and you move to a different media of sales, like virtual, you're starting to think, how do I, I have this muscle, oh, look at that. I have this muscle, but I, uh, I, I, how am I going to translate that and continue to use that muscle in my virtual interactions with customers? Oh, video, right? Now, I won't wax on about what I believe the detriments to video and Zoom are on virtual solar sales, but um, we've done a lot of testing, and the number one thing I say is switch to phones. On phones is what we're going to be focusing on today. We don't have body language. Now, there could be an argument to said while you, for example, when I'm doing sales calls, I'm up, AirPods, walking around, you know, hand movements, and, and that definitely affects it, right? So let's not say body language is 0%, but obviously body language diminishes, right? When you're moving to virtual. And so 
what takes the cake, what takes the, 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 the prize, right? Body language got caught for using a performance enhancing drugs. Now it's out. And number two is number one, tonality. Oh, let's go. And so when we have this tool now, this, this muscle, now we, we do have this muscle, regardless of whether you're doing virtual or not, but it's not, it's not worked out, right? And so we take a look at tonality and it's getting a bit difficult. And I see these in-home guys trying to translate the body language to Zoom and let's cut that. Let's start to realize how important tonality is to virtual sales, whether you're doing Zoom or not. But if you're doing strict phones, which is my favorite type of virtual, it is the bread and butter. And we really need to understand that. Okay. Um, so uh, let's move on here. Um, with our 60, 30, 10 rule, we now understand that body language is out for the most part, body language is out and tonality is in. And this is the example that I usually use, you know, at the end of matrix one, Neo, he never really knew he was the one, uh, he never really understood it. He never, nothing broke free. But at the end, agent Smith is at the end of the hallway. They're about to fire, uh, guns at him. And all of a sudden he just naturally, wait, I've had it the whole time. Puts his hand up. The bullets stop in his hands and they drop in front of him. And all of a sudden the code starts pouring from the walls and from these programs in front of him. And he realizes, huh, this is it. I had this all the whole time. I had this muscle. I had this vision. I had this data source. I just didn't tap into it. And that is really what it feels like. And I've seen it myself and hundreds of, of reps and uh, teams that I brought over to virtual. The second it clicks for them, it's a light bulb. It's, oh, and when you realize all the data that is streaming out of things, out of situations, out of you and your customer, uh, and that, that data is primarily tonality, it changes the game for you. So that is the key for you to have your Neo moment. All right. Um, understand how important tonality is there. So when we look at tonality, tonality is the most important muscle in virtual solar sales. Your body language is drastically muted, if not gone in virtual sales. Tonality becomes your biggest strength and potentially weakness if you've never worked it out before. And now you have to rely on this massive data stream from both you and your customer and you have no idea how to handle it. That's not a good situation. That calls for awkward interactions with your customers and not being able to control situations properly and getting your, your results, right? So it could be a very big strength for you. Uh, because tonality is very, very strong if used properly, but also could be a weakness. So keep that in mind, strengthen that muscle. Number three, tonality becomes your biggest data stream for customers. You can no longer have direct uh, uh, communication with them. You're not directly with them. Yes, okay, Zoom, you can see them a bit, fair enough, but it's not really the same as you're, when you're an in-person. Um, but when you're in virtual, it, tonality is, is your biggest uh, stream. We all think it's the words that we say. But it's, it's not, right? Context is so important. Contextual um, feeling and understanding of what's going on in the situation um, and uh, hearing your customer's tonality. Are they confused? Are they happy? Are they angry? Are they, are they getting pissed off with you? What's going on there? Tonality becomes your biggest data stream from your customers. And, um, it, it, and from you as well, right? Let's not, keep, uh, uh, let's not forget that. And I'm going to uh, touch on that in a sec here. And number four, tonality becomes your primary source of energy for conversations. So let's see my, my pitch is perfect, but my tonality is just super monotone. I need to be able to, and maybe in my head, I've never really had to contrast my tonality because of oh, it has my body language and someone throws me their bill. I want to give them a little bill shock. And I go, whoa, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of money. Are, are you guys doing okay? That body language is definitely going to uh, uh, communicate something. But now that I can't do that, I can't have those shocked body language uh, uh, cues from my customers. My tonality is what I'm relying on to, to increase the energy, decrease the energy, the conversations, right? There's a very uh, good quote from an uh, ancient, ancient philosopher, a very, very wise man um, in his day. The quote is, Ye solar reps who forego the ancient, the, the ancient practice of tonality are destined to live in squalor. Or Joshius Kingius, I believe that was from the um, second century A.D. Uh, in the uh, Greater Istiplian Greek era. Yeah, you guys wouldn't know him, but um, he, he was he's right when he said it. Right. Um, if you uh, forget tonality, if you don't understand the importance of it, then you're going to miss out on a lot of communication, a lot of cues from your customers and a lot of opportunity. Right. Um, and ultimately, you know, what I want everyone to come away thinking, uh, if you, if you got nothing else from this, right, 
Um, it's just to never skip tonality day. This is just a fundamental thing. I see it all the time. It breaks my heart. People are amazing in person. Their body language is fantastic, but then the tonality is just horrible. It's not a good thing, guys. Never skip tonality day. You've heard it here first. Actually, you know, Joshius Kingius from the second uh, century AD, I think he was the first to make this meme, but um, very, very important. If you're wanting to improve your results or transition to virtual, focus on your tonality. It is your bread and butter. It is your sword. It is your ace up your sleeves. It's your a smoking gun. You've got this, but focus on your tonality. All right. Tonality, big piece to the puzzle here. Oh, let's get into the second uh, slideshow here. So the next thing I want to go over, many of you might've seen this, uh, this uh, slide before, but it is so important um, that I'm going to repeat it when we're talking about structure of script. Now, another reason I'm showing this is because I'm just a really good graphic artist, uh, in case you missed it. B brilliant, brilliant. I think, you know, uh, Michelangelo back in his day couldn't compete, but um, structure. What is structure and what is the importance of it? Can't, why can't I just be a good salesperson and talk uh, the customer's ear off and get deals done? Why is structure of pitch, structure of your logic of your pitch so important? If you haven't seen this uh, diagram before, well, I'll show it to you right now. So we have a customer. They want to get from point A to point B. Okay, fair enough, we say. Mr. Customer, I'm going to help you do that. I understand where you are, where you need to go, and I have the solution for you. Um, so you go to your customer, and uh, he's in, in trouble. Uh, he has those goals to get from point A to point B. And uh, you say, no worries, Mr. Customer. Oh, I think we're a bit backwards here, actually. Let me try again. Let's get back here. Um, so we go to Mr. Customer and say, no worries, Mr. Customer. Um, I know you want to get from point A to point B. I have a perfect solution for you. I'm going to drop a massive concrete block right in the middle there. You'll be able to get to wherever you need to be. Customer's going to look at you and be like, what? No, no. I, I, how does that going to help? No, I'm, I got to think about this. This doesn't make sense to me. I, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's not working. The, the logic is not there for me. Of course, of course, because your structure is all over the place. And this is what everybody does. You go in trying to sell something that your customer doesn't need, they uh, know they need, right? It's not a good time. When you go in and you try to push something that doesn't have value to your customer initially, and you haven't set up that uh, value and, and uh, uh, presented your solution as something that they need to solve a problem that they have, that they already know they have, it just becomes a waste of space. And what do they say? Not interested, don't have time right now, my budget's not there, I'll, I'll, I'll call you back, I gotta think about it. You have pushed the benefits of solar down their throat so much before even mentioning the problem that they have. And this is one of, if not many, one of the major uh, problems that people have in structure right now. So instead, um, you throw in that concrete block there. Instead, what we need to do is show that customer, Mr. Customer, I know you have to get from point A to point B. No worries. I have a solution for you. But hold on. You have this massive fiery chasm of fire and, and bad stuff. Wow, good. No, no wonder you need help here. You're never going to get to where you need to, to be. You have to get a solution that works for you. The customer sees that and they're like, damn, I never even realized that the fire was there. I saw a few snakes in there, but guys, things on fire now. It's even better, worse than I thought. And then you go, no worries. I've got you. I'm going to put this massive concrete block right in the middle there. You'll be able to walk freely from point A to point B. Now, was my product different? Was my pitch different? No. My pitch was identical, if not word for word. I've gotten pretty good at doing this slide. Re replay, if you're watching the replay right now, my pitch for the product was identical. But the first instance did not make sense because the customer really didn't know what was going on and therefore the solution did not hold value. So in your structure, when you're looking at your structure for solar, nobody wants a solution to a problem they don't have. And uh, one of the five strategies I'm going to go over in a sec here is making damn well sure that the timing in which you're presenting your solution is not before they figure out the problem, but that uh, after they figured out the problem, that you've presented it and shown them that they actually have something that they need to solve, right? What's the stereotypical telemarketing script? Hello, sir. I'm from ABC Auto Insurance. I'm wondering if you want to upgrade your auto insurance. Pfft, no, get off. Thanks, mate. Imagine. Imagine if they just went in with some basic training um, and went up and said, hey guys, yeah, I'm just you know, letting you know your, your car insurance is about to go up by 15%. Did you know that? Just, just making sure you're, you're aware. What? It is? I never got a notice here. It is, it is. But look, don't worry about it. We're going to stop that from happening. Now, I'm not saying that's an amazing script, but 10x results just off of that. Get your problem in front of your solution. 
Don't offer a solution to someone uh, for a problem that they don't know they have or that they, they don't have in general. Focus on making sure your structure is there. So let, let's take a look at a, a bit more here. Outside of making sure the order of things is there, structure also gives you a path to succeed, a path to your goals, right? Without structure, you're going in blind. You, you know you want to get a deal. You know you want to get an install. You know you want to be a billionaire, a trillionaire. Everyone knows that, but nobody has structure and, and order um, and a path uh, in order to get there, right? It's so common for people to have end goals, but not a clear path of how do we get there. I want to close this customer. I know I want their signature on this installation contract. I know I want that finance contract approved, but how do I get there? Oh, I'll just talk to them about how amazing solar is, show them the utility rate increases, and you know, hopefully something happens. Get lost. That's not how to scale. That's not how to be successful in solar. You need a structure. You need a process. All right. So for example, um, uh, I always use this uh, uh, little analogy here. We have Mount Everest, right? Now, do you think anyone ever looked at the top of that behemoth and said, you know what? Hi, Mike. Yeah, you reckon we should get up there? Yeah, oh, yeah, sure. H how do you reckon we do it? Oh, I think we just give up. We just go. We, just, we, we figure it out on the way out, hey? Yeah, good idea, mate. Let's crack a beer. Let's go. No, it's not happening. Have you guys seen um, what's uh, Al Alex Honnold's, uh, you know, the, the documentary about him free climbing, I think it's called, uh, whatever it is. He, he's climbing without a rope off uh, El Capitan, one of the steepest, biggest uh, cliffs in the world. And before he does this, and this is with every free climber and every climber and every hiker and ex extreme, they, they're figuring out every single foothold before they get there. So in their head, they're visualizing, I have to take this one first and then this one. And then 20,000 footsteps later, they're at the top. But they are not looking at it and saying, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll just, I'll just close it. Right? I'll just uh, go to the top and we'll figure it out. No. So if you're looking at solar sales right now, virtual solar sales, you're not achieving the goals you want. That is a lofty goal but you don't have a clear structure, a clear order, a clear process for what you're taking the customer through and that there's logic behind what you're doing there and that it makes sense to the customer, that's where you need to start. Stop worrying about what's the best close, what magic words do I do to close deals. Start looking at the beginning of the process and line up something concrete in black and white, one, two, three, that makes sense to you, but also that makes sense to your customers. Because if you just start climbing Mount Everest and you expect to get to the top of the, hill, the, the mountain without perfectly planning exactly how you're going to get there. You're going to die. You're not going to last. You're not going to reach the end goal. That's just the, the bottom line. That's how these things go, right? I hope that makes sense. Number three, we're blazing through this stuff because so, I got these strategies I want to go over with you guys. Number three, uh, control. Okay. Now, control has always been seen as a bad word. You don't want to be controlling. You don't want to control your customers, do you? Let me, let me throw some rose colored glasses on top of this word control. If you don't have control, your customer is not going to trust you. If you don't seem that you're uh, in control, you know what you're doing, you have a structure, you have an order of things, then why would they trust you with anything? You're asking them to, to make a decision, whether it's they're saving 50 bucks a month or, you know, it's an amazing decision to make or not. You're still asking them to make a decision. And, 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 and what it looks like ultimately is that you're advising them to do something. Now, have you ever gone to someone that you don't trust and you've taken their advice? No. So you need to maintain a healthy control. Control is confidence. Control, positive, healthy control is peace of mind for your customers. Control is authority for you, which ultimately gives your customers peace. Control is knowledge. If you have control, you have a structure, you have an order, even though maybe, you know, you're even newer to the industry, you don't know the ins and outs of all this stuff, that's fine. But you want to give your customers peace of mind. That's who they're going to choose to get their solar done. The person that they get peace of mind from, they have confidence in, they know is a, an authoritative figure and has knowledge in what they need to have knowledge in. Okay, control can be positive. Um, and that's what I think a lot of people, especially in the North American culture, we're a bit more soft. We don't like annoying people. So with these words and these concepts, we sort of run away from them. But I'm telling you, put your rose colored glasses on. If you're doing the right thing, if you're ethical, if you're lining them up with proper solutions and all your systems and your installers are doing right, then controlling your customer to a specific point ends up being more positive for them, right? Uh, instead of letting them run loose. So for example, we have a professor. We walk in or a judge or a lawyer, whatever this very powerful man is. And we're looking for advice. We walk in, open the door. He's sitting there. Yes. How can I help you? 
you sit down and like, man, I, I'm just in some trouble right now. I've got, um, I've got this going on. I know you're, you're very, you know, you're connected and you have a lot of experience. You know, what, what would you suggest I do? Yes. Hmm. This is what I would do. A, B, C, C, and D. This is what you have to do. Do this and then do this. Now tell me, this guy, with this authority and this control of the situation, are you going to go back and say, nah, I'll think about it. No. You're going to pick up on that advice immediately. Look at the environment he's in. Look at the control he has. You trust this guy. Why? Why? Is it because he's wearing a black robe? Is it because he has... Well, sort of. But this this, this aura about him and he's telling you exactly this is what you need to do. I have experience. I have knowledge. And this is what your, your plan should be if you want to succeed. If you want to fix this problem. However, on the opposite end, if you're not like that and you're just going to your customers, yeah, I mean, maybe you could do this. I'm, I'm not really sure. Well, your customer's not going to take your advice. You got to be this guy in sales, solar sales. You got to be this guy. You got to sit down. You have that authority. You have control over the situation. And most importantly, they trust you and you're doing things properly so that when you tell them this is the best option, they don't say, I got to think about it. They say, yeah, I agree. Let's get this done right now. Right? And this is the aura that you need to give off. Not a, oh yeah, if you want to take control of the situation, you are the uh, authority here, you are the professional, and you have the ability to either drive them to the right decision or potentially uh, uh, not attract them, not give them peace of mind and some, someone else picks them up and, and, and does something sketchy. So it's your job to have that control and authority in order to push the customer in the direction that's going to most benefit them, okay? And if you're a, uh, an ethical operator in solar, uh, as long as you're doing things right, it's pretty beneficial for customers in case you didn't know. So here's some five strategies that I want to help you guys all with uh, your tonality structure and control, okay? So number one strategy, nail your tonality your tonality. Record yourself pitching. This is this is insider information, all right? You, if you've not done this before, you have to do this. If you guys ever remember the first time you ever heard yourself on recording, whether it was like uh, you're recording music or on your phone or something. Uh, I remember when, when smartphones first came out, we started recording each other and then you'd hear it and you're like, do I really sound like that? Um, if you've never done that before in sales, in a sales pitch, I know it sounds weird, do it. You might be there. In fact, I would suggest you're almost guaranteed to be surprised about some of the things that you do, whether your pitch or how uncertain you sound, your ums, or your gaps or the lack of control you have. Record yourself running your pitch. You don't have to do it with someone or you could just get your roommate or wife or uh, a boyfriend and, and, and give her a go. Get your friend over and say, yeah, I'm just going to record myself and you just naturally say whatever you want to do. Listen to it back. And keep doing that process until you like what you sound like in terms of your, your tonality, your structure and control. So, so valuable for you to do, okay? Might sound crazy, try it. Try it tonight if you've never done it before. It does actually help you. Number two, watch your upward inflections in brackets uncertainty. So all my teams, all my guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I, I rip on this a lot. Upward inflections are something we very naturally do, especially in the North American culture where it's, uh, you know, you imagine the, the West Coast, like, yeah, and I was just getting a Starbucks and uh, this guy came up to me and he's like, yeah, that almost sounds a bit, you know, uh, Canadian, but you, you get the point. California girl, right? West Coast uh, girl, um, always ending every sentence in a question. We do this in sales as well, sometimes subtly, sometimes uh, not subtly. Now, what an upward inflection is, for example, I'm talking to a customer and I'm going, Mr. Customer, yeah, look, um, a lot of our customers, uh, you know, end up saving, you know, 20 to 30 percent on their bill. It's it's pretty powerful. You know, our, our warranties are great. Um, yeah, I mean, if uh, it, we have about of a 25 or 30 year warranty, depending on the panel. So it's like this thing that we've started to do naturally. But if you think about it, what is an upward inflection? What is that attached to? It's attached to a question. And what are questions? Has anyone ever asked a question because they knew the answer? Well, you know, maybe to start a conversation. But generally, you don't ask questions if you know the answer. You ask a question because you're uncertain. So what does our lobster brain do? Our brains are, are always finding patterns, right, in reality and in life. And, and that's how we make a, a, we, we a journey through the, the, the world that we live in. We find patterns. That, okay, this is what this is. This, this, is, this is a cup. This is a, this is a phone. I use this to do things. And then we listen to other people. And so when other people are asking questions and they have upward inflections, they're okay. They're asking a question. They don't know something, right? 
So when you start using upward inflections, and again, record yourself pitching, you'll hear it uh, very, very obvious if you do it. Um, every single sentence, you'll have an upward inflection when you should have a downward inflection. What's a downward inflection? Mr. Customer, yeah, look, you're going to save cash. Uh, that's just the bottom line. Uh, you know, a lot of our customers save up 20, 30%. It's a, it's a no brainer. Again, I don't need any extra cash from you. Your bill just goes down. The government incentives, you know, uh, cover all the upfronts. So you're good to go. That sounds pretty confident versus just questions at the end of every sentence. Downward inflections mean factual information, the opposite of uncertainty. So record yourself and watch your upward inflections in your tonality. Okay. Number three, practice tonality contrast. So of course I'm, I'm talking about don't be monotone, but I'm also talking about have contrast where you need to have contrast. Hint, hint, bill shock, right? Need I say more? Customer says they have a $500 uh, a bill. You better have a little contrast with that whopper of a bill. Are you just going to, oh, you have $500 bill? Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah, so, uh, you know, why, why do you think it's so high? Customer tells you have a $500 bill. That tonality contrast has to be through the roof. $500? 500, did you, sorry, you said $200. I think I misheard you. This, this damn form. 500? Are you serious? Freak out a bit, man. This, they got to know something's wrong. And if you guys don't think $500 a month for your electricity is high, what crazy rock are you living under, man? That is a lot of money. And regardless of how much money they're spending on power, they could be spending $100 a month on power. Solar's going to uh, uh, save them cash, right? So tonality contrast on the specific moments, uh, maybe bringing it low, lower energy on the conviction side of things when you're um, uh, showing them the warranties that this is just a no brainer. This is a, a really simple solution. Um, and maybe higher when you're talking about those utility rate increases and how they're going to affect the future and how we can stop that from happening. Um, and having that contrast and that controlled contrast and not just throwing up the uh, high contrast and low contrast and crazy tonality pitches all over the joint, but knowing where to uh, implement them in your pitch to have a more dynamic pitch and get your customer's brain to flare up and engage when they need to and just think, oh yeah, that, that makes sense when it needs to be just a no-brainer solution for them, right? So practice tonality contrast where it needs to go. And number four, practice moderate tonality to allow contrast. This is interesting pattern I've seen. Everyone has different uh, average levels of tonality, right? So uh, some people are way up here. Hey, hey, John, how you doing? I'm just giving you a call today. And some people are just, hey, uh, no, I'm just sitting in the office right now. No, yeah. Um, so have you heard about our solar program? Now, those are very contrasting. But the issue is when you have, when you're way up here from right from the very beginning, wow, that's a really big bill. And you got to do a bill shock to, 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 to get their... Um, uh, lobster brain uh, flaring up and saying, oh, there's something wrong. He, he sounds excited. I have nowhere to go. If I'm, oh, I'm way up here, I can't even go any higher. I can't get any more excited. So then, you know, I'm technically monotone the whole point. And if I'm way down here and I'm just always talking like this and I start the conversation off like this, uh, but then something gets to the point where I need to, um, you know, go even lower and, you know, and talk about a factual statement. I got nowhere else to go without sounding like bloody Eeyore, right? So make sure you're starting out at a moderate tonality so that you have room to go both up and go down when you need to, okay? Tonality contrast and knowing when to go up, when to increase excitement and when to go down and more talk about a factual statement. We're talking about a no brainer. This is easy, is very important and allowing yourself to do that when you initiate. It's important to initiate the conversation with this level of tonality. Because, you know, you, can, you can't you can fix it later on if you initiate. Your customer's like, oh, he's always that high, right? Or he's always that low. Um, so if you start the, the call off, start the, the um, conversation off at a moderate tonality and allow yourself room to grow, that's the best way to do it, okay? So nail your tonality. Number two, jump in here. Number two, listen to your customer's tonality. Okay, so we have our tonality down. We start to listen to our tonality. We get the rules. Now is when it really gets interesting. You can no longer see your customer's body language or Zoom. Okay, I guess. But again, it's different. And I, I don't like Zoom. When you can't see your customer's body language, what are you, you, what are you just going to sell blindly? No, you have tonality. And tonality is a wealth of information. Again, I showed that uh, matrix uh, thing. The second it clicks for you. You can start listening to your customer's tonality. Listen to other people talk just, just tonight or tomorrow or go on YouTube. Listen to people talk. 
um, uh, turn the video off and figure out, become good at listening to their tonality and trying to imagine what their face looks like. That's an interesting um, uh, thing that you can do. Because if you can do that, uh, you know, if, if it, you can pretty much uh, tell what someone's face looks like by if they're smiling or, you know, their voice changes, you can start getting a bigger picture of what type, you know, what, what they're going on about. Um, for example, you know, you get real hardcore and you can listen to uh, the customer's volume and their tonality as they move away from microphones and look at their spouse for, uh, you know, approvals. Gets yeah, pretty niche. But start by listening to your customer's tonality and just see what you can pick up. Okay. For example, listen for tonal cues. Okay. Um, so you're studying the language of tonality and listen to tonal because it is a language. It 100% is a language. Listen for tonal cues. So um, you explain a really important concept, right? Really important concept, numbers or something or warranty. And you go back to the customer and you do a little tonal cue uh, checkup. Does that make sense, John? Mary, are you still with me there? Hear nothing. John goes a second later. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. And you don't hear anything from, from Mary. John sounded a bit, oh, what was going on there? Okay, that's that's uh, uh, an indication you need to get them engaged more, right? Or uh, you get a yep customer. We call them yep customers. So you explain uh, a really powerful topic. You show them $50,000 in savings. And, and from day one, they're saving 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks a month. And you go back to John and say, you see those numbers, John? They look pretty exciting, don't they? And John goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They look, yeah. Oh, come on. Just off of tonality there, I know there's something going on. He has an objection. He's thinking about something. He doesn't understand the numbers. I cannot move on with the rest of my pitch unless I figure out why he sounded the way he sounded right there. He said, yep. He said, yes. Technically, he says, yes. If we're just going off of script, I'm good, right? No, the tonality, right, is not where I want it to be. So I need to jump back in there and figure out what is going on, okay? Um, so listen for tonal cues. Uh, also confusion, right? What does a confused customer sound like tonally? Um, um, so you go and say, yeah, does that make sense, John? He goes, uh, yeah, yeah, right? You can hear the ton tonal differences. And you guys may be watching this and yeah, that make it's obvious, but it is a, uh, it's an art. And if you're in the heat of the moment in sales, you need to uh, figure out this language. What's the difference between a, uh, yep, yep, yep. Anybody in virtual, those three right now, you definitely know the difference. But if you're listening right now and you're like, what, what the hell was that? What's the difference between those three? Study the language of tonality. It is fascinating. Number three, match your customer's tonality to build rapport. I am a chameleon. I do this naturally. I do even do accents sometimes. Um, I, I, I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm not trying to make fun of people's uh, accents. But um, if, I, if I get on the phone with someone with an accent, I just naturally go there. I don't know why. It's just, it's just, it's nice. It feels nice to match customers' um, accents. And the same can be done with tonality. Are they just down here, nice, softly spoken? Are they up here? Are they deep? Uh, what's going on here? If I get on the phone with a guy with a, with a deeper voice than me, um, <clears throat> yeah, John, yeah. Hey, no, it's just Josh here. How you doing? Yeah, no, I'm just following up with you. You got her, right? Now, uh, think about it. It's just like uh, mirroring customers' body language. Um, put that customer in their friend circle. And I can almost guarantee you they have a few friends, if not all of them, and their tonality starts to match when they get with each other or they're just uh, always like that. And that's just how they are. So if you can match that, if you can mirror what they're used to, there's a little psychological rapport, a little one, two, 3% increase on the rapport level, right? Um, so match your customer's tonality uh, to build a little rapport. Meet them at that moderate level. What, whatever moderate level they're at, meet it there. Because obviously it goes without saying, you get a nice old lady on the phone, you're not going to be like this. Hey, day, hey, uh, Margaret, how you doing today? I'm just here to, maybe so dumb, right? So match your customer's tonality and uh, uh, become their friend uh, through that little psychological trick. Number four, address tonality changes immediately. So like I mentioned, I heard a tonal change. Customer says, uh, yeah, immediately I'm thinking, oh, they're confused. There's clearly something they don't understand, right? So I need to address that immediately. What a lot of people get wrong is they'll hear that, they might even pick up on it, but they'll get, go to the next section and they'll move on with their script. No, why were you doing that? If you, if you pinpoint something is going on um, that uh, the customer is not understanding you, that uh, there's some sort of confusion, they don't understand the numbers, they have a, a, a hidden objection, something's going on there, you need to jump in there and fix that issue and make sure that, that uh, that you solve that problem before moving on to the next step. Because what happens if you don't? 
What happens if you move on to the next step and they have this misconfusion, they have this um, objection, all that, that all that's going to happen is 50% of the words that you say in the next thing is going to go over their heads. Because now all they can think of is, wait, how the hell, what, what was 6%? What is the 6%? Hold on, 6% of, 6% of what? What is it, 1.99? What, 1.91 of what? While I'm blabbering on about amazing warranties, and it's just like, wah, 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 because I'm thinking, what the hell these percentages mean? So get back in there, look them virtually in the eyes through the tonality, figure, make sure they're, they're understanding everything and jump straight back in. Hey, John, you sound a bit of confused there, mate. What was, uh, what was the issue? If he doesn't give you anything and you know, there's something to it, a trick I always use, use the, uh, use the spouse built, you built rapport with uh, Mary. Hey, Mary, John's not giving me much here, but I, it sounds like he's confused. What do you think? You think it's the numbers, Mary? I can go over it again if he wants me to. Then Mary looks at John's like, what's wrong? Tell him. Right. And you squeeze some objections out that way. Right. So address tonal changes. Don't just hide from them. If you do pick up on something, stop, dress it, do it like uh, very straightforward if you need to. And just say, hey, you sound like you don't understand. Let's get this. Let's get this done. What, what don't you understand? OK, so address those tonal changes. Uh, that is make or break. If you leave them, uh, it could be the reason you don't close that deal. OK, so um, listen to your uh, your tonality. Number three, know your structure, right? So when you have a structure and when you have a plan to climb Mount Everest, uh, you can start putting the pieces together and, and go for it. When you don't, like I've said before, and you're jumping into this, you're just going to get so chaotic, right? We're going to get to what that what happens with the customer. But for you, you got to ask yourself, look at your script, look at your pitch, and hopefully you, you do have one. If you don't and you're doing virtual, make a pitch, write it out now. And ask yourself when you're looking at it, am I selling something before they know they need it? That's the number one thing. Remember we did that beautiful graphic of the stick man? Are you selling something before the customer knows they need it? Are you trying to book an appointment in with them before they understand their problem? Are you trying to ask them for prerequisites, credit card information, not credit, um, credit uh, number, credit score number, FICO, FICO? Uh, are you trying to ask them for their address? Are you trying to ask them for confirming their email? Are you asking when they're free tomorrow? Are you asking any of these questions? Are you trying to show them the benefits of solar? Are you explaining warranties? Um, are you explaining how solar works before they understand that they need it or before they understand their problem? Because if you are, what you got to do is take those two sections and swap them, right? Let me do that again. It's a pretty advanced move. Everyone watching eyes up here. One, two, swap them. Boom. All right. Make sure your structure is in place that you are not selling something. You're not asking for something either. For example, prerequisites until the customer has a reason for you to give them until the customer has a reason to listen to you until the customer understands their problem and now wants a solution fundamental in your structure. Number two, break down your pitch into concepts. Okay. So, um, I, we review scripts every day at VSC people submit their scripts and, um, I'll get a, a page like this, you know, and it's just paragraphs. Boom. Right. The first thing that I always do is work on the formatting of scripts. Let's forget about what's in the script. Let's work on the formatting, um, breaking your script down into, for example, four fundamental concepts, um, uh, very easily under understandable concepts. Don't write any words, write the title of each concept, one, two, three, four, whatever the title is. And the, let's say two or three goals that you want to, uh, achieve in uh, each concept. Okay. So one, two, three, four, label those concepts and then three bullet points of what you want to achieve. Um, and what you want the customer to know in each concept, then you, now you have that now put that to the side and now write your word for word script, right? Concepts and then filling it with words. Okay. Super, super important. Um, that'll greatly help you because when you're doing virtual and you're like, I need a script. You just get a you know Google Doc and you start writing words on the page. A lot of things happen. First off, it's confusing. You can't figure it out. Your your brain's a computer, but it's not organized properly. Then when you're on calls with customers, you lose track of time. The customer throws an objection at you. You lo look back at this page that's full of hundreds of words, and you start rereading in your head. Where were you? Okay, did I say that already? While the customer's barking at you, telling you, "What if it penetrates my roof? I don't want to." Do you have any warranties for that? And you're just like, boom, mind goes blank. Deal is done. Right. Have it structured so that you look at that page for two seconds, have it on your wall or have it on your screen or whatever it looks like. Just have it somewhere. So at any point in time, you can refer back to it and say, cool, I was there. Awesome. On to the next one. Right. Q 
Keep your brain organized, keep your script organized, make sure you're hitting all the concepts that you need. Start with concepts and fill it with words. Number three, have your script in front of you, already went over that at all times to refer to it. Number four, don't skip around, stick to your structure like glue. And so either you or your customer can uh, derail you from your structure. Customer jumps in right away and says, I love this, I wanna go for it, I'm just telling me the price. Or I love this, this sounds awesome, uh, you know, just tell me how solar works, right? Uh, it's up to you to stick to your guns because if you skip a very integral piece of your script, a piece of the structure there, you uh, make it uh, p potential that the customer is going to ask that question later on that you skipped and then just destroy your whole structure again and you're going to be all over the place. Stick to your structure like glue. Order, order, order. If a customer comes to you and says, ask you about a question, um, you say, awesome, Mr. Customer. Like I said, I'm going to cover that in a sec. So, and continue on where you were. Stick to your guns, stick to your structure. It greatly helps in your organization in the old noggin when you're trying to get through a very um, efficient script. So, if you uh, didn't know your structure, right, um, how the hell is your customer going to know it? So, this is going to bring me to my next point. It's the blind leading the blind. First off, if you don't know your structure, but let's say you do know your structure. Tell your customer your structure. Everyone these days thinks that their customers are absolute mind readers. It is a, it is a phenomenon that you think your customer goes in and goes, I know what you're about to say. That makes sense for me. For example, you go in, you're about to book your appointment, right? So you've, uh, you've told them solar, you've explained solar. And then instead of saying, cool, so here's what happens next. Here's the process. It's always a uh, awesome. So are you free tomorrow at 6 p.m.? Customers like, wait, what, what for, for what's that for? Right. Or, um, you start going into solar and the customer stops you and says, Hey, I'm really busy right now. Can you call me back later? They're saying that because they think you're trying to sell them on that call and you haven't clearly made it uh, identified that this is just a preliminary call. I'm going to ask you some pre-qualifying questions and we're going to line up something a bit later, uh, tomorrow and do things properly. Tell your customer, your structure. They are not mind readers. Oh, that's the wrong slide. They are not mind readers, okay? They don't see into their crystal ball and see what your structure, your process is, what you're trying to achieve on that call, what you're trying to achieve, achieve on the next call, if there is a next call, if there isn't a next call, what you need from them, um, or how solar works, uh, you know, at all. Don't assume uh, customers understand that. Tell them. Your customers are not mind readers. Tell them the plan. Use, this is what happens next, John, instead of just going, Okay, awesome, and just keep rambling on and assuming your customer knows your script in front of you. It's it's baffling seeing uh, this happen sometimes, but your customers are not mind readers. Tell them what's going on. It gives them peace of mind and it, it shows you to them as well that you have a structure, that you know what you're doing. There's a process to this and people like processes. They like structured, ordered processes in, in anything they do in life as opposed to just winging it, right? Number three, minimize customers jumping around by giving them an itinerary. So at the beginning, for example, of a... Um, uh, consultation. Um, the first thing that I always say is, uh, awesome guys. So look, this is what I'm going to be getting into after a little rapport building. This is what I'm going to be getting into. Just going to do a little bill analysis, really take a look at the numbers and see what's going on with that bill there. I know it's a bit confusing, so I'm going to try to explain those numbers clearly for you so you can see exactly what uh, the utility company is charging you for. Secondly, we're going to take a look at solar and really what solar is all about, the warranties and all that fun stuff and and um, see if you have any questions on that. It's a really simple process, but I'll try to keep it quick for you. Thirdly, we're going to take a look at the numbers. And honestly, at the end of the day, if they work, they work. If they don't, they don't. And fourthly, we're going to take a look at next steps if they do work. Does that make sense, John? Awesome. Perfect. Go into it. Now I'm in my first section and John goes and says, starts asking me about solar, but he knows I've already said it's a bill analysis section, right? So I can easily, without being rude, he while I'm in the middle of a bill analysis, he says, Hey, don't these solar panels come with a warranty? And I'll be like, yeah, that's a great question, John. Like I said, I'm going to cover that um, in just a few minutes here. We'll get right back to this and cover that. And he says, oh, right. Sorry, you did mention that. Go on. Right. It just allows you, it sets yourself up for being able to control the conversation a bit more and uh, maintain your structure. Okay. Um, so a really good uh, tool there to give your customer uh, your itinerary and your structure. And number four, put yourself in your customer's head. Right. Um, everyone falls prey to this and everyone, uh, you know, stops realizing that, that, you know, your customer doesn't know what you're doing. Your customer, uh, you might be saying things and what you're saying makes sense to you, but you've also been in solar for six months or two years or five years. Solar is very new. The concept is very new, especially on the financing side and how it's not actually a traditional cost and they're saving money. They're not spending money um, out of pocket. So don't 
assume that customers understand the concept of solar, for example. That's a concept we talk about a lot in Virtual Solar, uh, for solar Club. Don't assume it. Dot the T's, or uh, what is it? Dot the I's, cross the T's for your customers. Bridge the gap for your customer. Put your head in their head and ask yourself, if I'd never heard about solar before, did what I just said make sense? Would that make sense to me if I, I if I never heard about solar or how it works? No, no, it wouldn't make sense. Get back in there, re-explain it, right? Put yourself in your customer's head and ask yourself, are you making sense to them, right? They are not a mind reader. They don't have a crystal ball. They don't know what your itinerary is. They don't know what your goals are. So tell them what your goals are. Tell them what the structure is. Tell them what the itinerary is. It'll help you. Don't hide things, right? Be transparent. This is what we are going to do. This is the goals of the next call. This is just a preliminary call. What happens next is processes, structure, order, authority, control, Customers like that. They respond positively to it. They feel there is a system. There's a machine, right? And uh, everyone likes a well-oiled machine. Number five, control is a positive thing. Now, uh, again, could be uh, deemed as negative. You are a professional. You control the situation. Uh, do not let your customer control the situation. Use confident language uh, versus uncertain phrases. I think this might be the best. Well, maybe we can take a look at this. Uh, no. You are the professional. You should know if you've been in solar for any time, you'll know more than 99% of customers out there are what about the best option is and what's you know uh, doesn't actually help in savings. You are the person that needs to take control of that situation. Tell them what the best option is, okay? Um, and if you don't know what the best option is, go to someone who does and ask and then line them up with it. End sentences with engagement questions, for example, to minimize question and answer cycle as well is a, is a very powerful um, thing to keep in mind. Question and answer cycle, many VSC people already know this, is when your customer takes control and you, for example, they ask you a question, maybe they interrupt you, right? And they say, oh, sorry, John, what, what do you, how long was the warranty again? And you go back to them and say, oh yeah, it's 25 years. And you stop talking. What that says to your customer is, he stopped talking, it's now my turn to start talking. So that's called the question and answer cycle because you went from pitching them to now answering questions, them asking a question, answering questions, them asking a question. Control is now in their hand. And a lot of customers will, not, not a lot, but a, a few customers will try to take control. They'll do this naturally because that's just the type of person they are. So if you ever a, uh, answer a question, always end it up with an engagement question or continue on to the next step. Yeah, John, so they're, they're, they're 25 years, 25 to 30, depending on the panel that we use. Does that make sense, John? Have you seen any, any other um, warranties uh, before? Right? Boom. You reversed it. Now you're asking the questions. You're controlling the, the conversation. Now you might be watching this and saying, oh, that's petty. But I promise you, friend, for everyone who, who already knows how powerful this is, it is a very important thing that you need to be making sure of because very quickly, if you don't pay attention to the question and answer cycles, it could turn in from you pitching them to them uh, picking you apart and figuring out why they don't want solar and then uh, you know, convincing themselves and talking themselves out of it, okay? Watch your question and answer cycles. Always end uh, sentences with engagement questions to move the conversation forward, to take control back, or um, move on to the next section, okay? Number four, pay attention to power dynamics. Who is leading the conversation? Like I said, if a customer is asking the questions, you're not leading the conversation and you are the professional. Act like it. Number five, don't give your customers something just because they ask for it. Yeah, Josh, no, I saw a power cell on uh, Facebook, so I want a power cell. You mean power wall? Yeah, yeah, power wall. I want a power I want two of them, actually. I, if I don't get that, though, I'm not interested. Yeah, uh, John, you have one-to-one -one net metering, and you have a, uh, a $50 bill, and you told me you use 90% of your energy during the day. No, 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 I don't want it. Okay, John, okay, well, you know. Guy, there's so much out there that customers see online. You have to know what the best option there is for them. There's so much stuff that they'll ask you about. And if you present, present this situation in which they are the ones determining what they get, now it could be, they might be well-researched, who knows? But a lot of times they're not. You have to be the one to push them into what is good for them. And that's a, that's a moral question, to be honest. Because if you're just looking to get deals, the, your, your head's going to be like, I'll give them what I want and they'll close deals. It actually is the opposite. If you just start giving them what they want and not having a process and uh, and 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 pushing them towards what is really uh, going to save them the most amount of money, you're actually going to see your deals decrease because your control and your authority decreases as well. So it is a very symbiotic relationship of you being the professional. You need to act like it. Um, 
putting them where they need to be, showing them, putting their eyes on what's important and lining them up with the solution that's actually going to save them the most money and is specific for their um, uh, their uh, uh, environment that they're in, whether it's their energy usage, their property type, uh, whatever it looks like, right? Because um, there's crazy stuff online about solar right now. So you're going to get customers, you know, more and more so as the market matures, telling you they saw this, you saw this, they want this, they want this. You need to get in there, control the conversation and be that guy in that library office, sit down with them, have that authority, present that control and say, no, this is what you need to do. And you want that reaction from them because of how you've set yourself up, that they trust you and then they go uh, with, uh, you know, what, what um, you've, you've uh, told them is best for them, right? That is your goal. Um, and that's why control can actually be a positive thing. You go into a doctor's office, you say, hey doc, look, saw something online about, uh, my, my shoulder's been hurting a bit. I saw something online about shooting black tar heroin into my shoulder. Doctor, if he really didn't know what he was doing, you know, uh, he's gonna be like, uh, well, yeah, sure, that sounds good. That's not a doctor, guys. <laughs> a doctor goes to you and says, no, we're not going to be doing that. You're going to be taking these vitamins and, and uh, working out three times a week and fix your diet. He's going to tell you what's going on because he knows better than you. If you go start uh, giving your customers exactly what they need just because they ask it um, and uh, not lining them up with what uh, you know is actually going to benefit them, you're not a doctor, you're Dr. Evil. And that's all I got for you. All right. So control or tonality, structure, and control. Focus on those three things. In virtual, it is very important to hit those because you lose a lot of your uh, muscles. You lose a lot of your tools when you switch to virtual, right? And those three things are sorely lacking across the industry right now. And I think uh, if you focus in on those and use those strategies that I went over there, um, you're going to see a, a definitely a, a, a different dynamic, at least, from you and what the customer and ultimately you're going to see a, a positive results. Okay. That's my take on it. We're 5:59. Oh, a minute early. Um, but, uh, I hope you guys got some value here. Um, stick on the outro video. As soon as I play, this is going to have some, um, uh, coupon and discount codes to uh, some of our, uh, virtual solar sales training resources, such as the largest virtual solar sales training content library in the world. Just so happens to be here at virtual solar club guys. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, let's see, I've got some uh, engagement, got some booms, got some uh, beers, uh, some love this. Ruby says, structure is everything. We've got some rocket chips from Jordan. Shout out Jordan. Uh, I'm glad to go. you guys got some value. Awesome, guys. Uh, unless I'm missing any, there's so many different screens and plan, plan everywhere. Oh, uh, Joe, yeah. Joe, 35 minutes ago, mentioned the name Free Solo. That was the uh, the movie of the guy climbing up the cliff. I, uh, I, I forgot the name of. Um. Cool, guys. I love it. Uh, I hope you got some value there. Next week, same thing, same time. We might even have a special guest. We're going to be lining up some interesting people on this mastermind um, and might be doing some different content, some maybe podcast style content and covering different topics, right? Um, so I'm very thankful that you guys have joined. Uh, for VSC members, jump into the Slack. Let's get some sales announcements in there. For non VSC members, we'd be happy to to have you a uh, ton of resources to help you switch from virtual or just to, you know, achieve your virtual solar sales goals, line up a strategy call with me. You can jump on virtualsolar.club and line that up, or just go to virtualsolar.club slash strategy call. Um, taking calls pretty much every day at this point to help people um, level up their virtual game. Cool. All right, guys, I'm going to see you. I'm going to love you and leave you uh, to my VSC crew that I'm seeing on Friday. I'll see you then. But for everyone else, I'll see you Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday. We'll be posting the poll for the following topic for, for next week, if we don't have a speaker, um, probably tomorrow or Friday. So stay tuned for that and make sure to vote, right? And throw a, a, a suggestion if you have one in there as well. Cool? All right, guys. Take it easy. Thanks very much. I'll see you later. See you Wednesday. See you Thursday, Friday. And most of all, happy selling. Solo, solo.